Good evening. I'm Sheldon Wine from the Philosophy Department, and uh, I'll be your host for the evening. Uh, welcome to the annual Public Philosophy Lecture Series. About uh, a decade ago, Roland Marshall, a longtime friend of St. Mary's and a former colleague of mine uh, before he retired uh, from the Philosophy Department, thought that it would be a good idea to have a lecture series which would show that philosophical training and philosophical thinking would serve not just to deal with perennial philosophical problems, but to deal with the issues that confront society uh, on a regular basis. And to that end, he very generously uh, funded this lecture series. Um, and I'm happy to see him in the audience tonight, right over here. So you can. So here's how the evening's going to go, or at least how I hope it's going to go. Uh, Dr. Colin Dodds, president of St. Mary's, is going to say a few words, giving you greetings from the university. Then Sheila Brown from the Canadian Institute for uh, Ethics and Public Affairs is going to say a few words, and then I will return and introduce our speaker, uh, Dr. Clarence Johnson, who will, I hope, speak and entertain you. And then, and then, now listen up, you will ask questions. Dr. Mercer, my chairperson, will uh, organize your questions, and then when questions have been answered, uh, we will, he will thank our speaker, and we will all retire to the lobby or the, and uh, enjoy some uh, food and drink. So, Dr. Dodds. Thank you, Sheldon, and it's just my great pleasure to welcome you all here for the annual lecture. I want to again pay tribute to uh, Dr. Roland Marshall for his vision for this event uh, and also the funding that he's provided. And not only has he done this, but there are other awards he's given um, uh, to the university for our students. So, Roland, again, thank you so much for that. So again, thank you for being part of this. Uh, this is an opportunity uh, I certainly, where I, when, I, when I can, enjoy, uh, enjoy the lectures, and I know we're going to have a very special one this evening. In fact, I've just come and I was just saying to our guest speaker that uh, there's an international uh, conference on right now that just started this evening uh, with respect to uh, the uh, African um, heritage, not just that we have, but other countries share. Uh, such as Bermuda and, and, of course, the United States. And I've just come from that conference. It's a very, very big thing for Halifax to have that. But anyway, my welcome for you this evening. And I'll hand back uh, to, uh, to Sheldon, and he's going to introduce Sheila Brown. Thank you very much indeed. You're very welcome. Sheila Brown is uh, the head of SESEPA, uh, the Canadian Institute for Ethics and Public Affairs, which co-sponsors this event, and she's going to uh, briefly say a few things. Sure. Good evening, everyone. It's a great pleasure to be here. On behalf of the Canadian Centre for Ethics in Public Affairs, I have the honour to be the Executive Director of the Centre, and on behalf of our Board and our General Manager, Chris Stover, I'm very happy to welcome you on behalf of, uh, of the Center. The Center provides an arena for critical thinking, public discussion, and research into current ethical challenges in society. We are a joint initiative of St. Mary's University and the Atlantic School of Theology. And I remember the origins of SESEPA when Dr. Dodds and I were at a, a meeting up in Cape Breton and uh, I and fellow university presidents had gone off to play golf and Dr. Dodds and uh, his colleague Dr. Close from AST were about more serious business and that was coming up with the idea of, of SESEPA. So here we are almost 10 years later uh, flourishing as a center. We don't do things on our own, we like to work in partnership and we're very happy to be in partnership with the Department of Philosophy here at St. Mary's around this annual lecture. I believe this is at least the third occasion in which we formally partnered 
and we're very happy about that collaboration and long may it continue. Ethics in public affairs, you might ask, well, what exactly is that? It's about how the values of individuals and organizations interact and how they evolve to enable us to live together and to work together as effectively as possible. We put on a lot of public presentations, we also support research, and we help organizations to build values and ethics more strongly into their own plans and strategies. Chris always gives me a checklist of things that I must do and say, so I'll draw your attention to the evaluation forms which are dotted around the room. It is helpful to SESEPA and the Department of Philosophy to have your feedback on this evening's program. It helps us as we plan future events. I also welcome you to go to the SESEPA website where you, we live stream our, our programs so that those who are not able to attend can view remotely, but we also archive material should you wish to look at any of our previous programs. And when we go outside for refreshments, you will see a table with a bunch of DVDs. It may look like a display, but you're actually very welcome to help yourself to any DVD that appeals to you. And if there's a big rush, for, for something that runs out, if you just uh, email Chris, she'll be happy to send you a complimentary copy of, uh, of that DVD. Before closing, I'd just like to tell you that tomorrow, SESEPA hosts another event at lunchtime on end-of-life decision-making across Europe by Penny Lewis from the School of Law and Centre of Medical Law and Ethics at King's College London. That is also live streamed, so if you can't leave your office to attend, you can eat your lunch in comfort and watch the, watch the presentation on our website, but you're also most welcome to attend the Weldon uh, Law Building um, on University Avenue. So uh, I just uh, close with those announcements and say how pleased again we are to be collaborating and how much we look forward to this evening's presentation and uh, uh, we hope to see you at future SESEPA events. Thank you very much. Um, over the past decade, this lecture series has brought uh, several distinguished scholars to Halifax to speak on issues including how we should understand our legal obligations, uh, when it is acceptable to appropriate uh, things from other cultures to our obligations to the very poor. We've heard from every, from everything, we've heard about everything from children's rights to the nature and prevalence of evil. For those of you who have children, those last two items were separate talks, uh, although you might wonder sometimes. Tonight we are very fortunate to have Dr. Clarence Cholet Johnson speak with us. Dr. Johnson was born and started his education in Freetown, Sierra Leone. As many of you know, there's a long tradition of immigration between Halifax and Freetown. And in the 1980s, Johnson decided to contribute his bit by moving to Halifax from Freetown. And in Halifax, he did his master's at a institution just to the north of here, which I won't name. Uh, later, he received his PhD from McGill University. Since that time, he has published widely on topics in the history of early modern philosophy, African thought, African-American thought, including a widely acclaimed book on Cornell West, and issues in contemporary Caribbean studies and political theory. He is now professor of philosophy at Middle Tennessee State University, and tonight he's going to speak to us on public morality, liberalism, and virtue ethics. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Johnson. Good evening, and thank you so much, Sheldon, for that very nice introduction. I want to begin by thanking um, President Dodds for being here. Um, we, my institution, we do have um, sessions like this, not the same, but public lectures, and I have not been privileged to see uh, my president in any of them, because I know that presidents usually have uh, onerous duties 
and it is very, very time consuming. So I applaud you for even taking the time to come to this session, especially since you've just been running from one other event to this one. So thank you so much for being here. Um, I also would like to thank uh, Sisepa for this, uh, having me as a speaker. Um, I saw some of the correspondences that uh, transpired between Chris Silva in particular and other members of the staff and Sheldon in preparation for this visit. And um, I thank you so much. You did quite a good job and I congratulate you all. Um, Halifax is not particularly new to me, but I've been here before and it was a uh, Pleasure to see Halifax again go around. And I do notice, uh, I think, Nathan Brett. Uh, there's a colleague and friend of mine, Nathan Brett from Dal. Um, I don't know if any other members of Dal are here, but, but it's really nice to be back. So this is uh, when I left Sierra Leone um, um, for Canada, Halifax was my first port of call. And I did the first leg of my graduate work here before transitioning to McGill University where I did my doctoral work and then stayed in Canada and taught there in Montreal, sorry, and um, taught at a college there, Marianopolis College, before I emigrated to the uh, United States. And so it's a pleasure to be back here. Um, my topic today is um, public morality, liberalism, and virtue ethics. And I want to look at three um, questions or three issues I want to investigate here. First, um, to what extent or in what, in what ways has there been a breakdown in public morality in contemporary society? Um, to what extent can it be said that the widespread acceptance of liberalism is in fact or in part responsible for such a breakdown? And if indeed there is a breakdown or has been a breakdown in public morality, then how are we going to fix it or what ought we to do? Um, let me begin by saying what I take public morality to be. I take public morality to be the, concerned with those values which are presupposed for any human interpersonal social existence. These values include things like trust, Honesty, integrity. If I can look, I can't see very well here. I've got to hold up my um, fairness, shame, self respect, and honor. And the list is not exhaustive. But I take these values as paramount or as a precondition for human social life, meaning that they are presupposed. Uh, by any cooperative endeavor, and without them, the human being cannot just function in any meaningful way whatsoever. These are values that we ought to pay attention to in our private as well as in our public lives. But one of the things I'm seeing is that these values seem to be flouted, especially in public domain. And I think I have an, a reason, I think I have a, an idea as to why this is the case, but I'm not so sure, so we'll look at that. But in any case, my justification for this list, for the primacy of this list, it draws support from um, a basic observation about the human condition by earlier philosophers, such as Aristotle and Hume, among others. For both Aristotle and Hume, the human being is not only naturally incapable of self-subsistence, but she also is designed by nature for social existence. And I know that Hume does not talk about nature designing anything, but you just allow that for the time being, because Hume does not subscribe to that view. I'm using design only in the sense of how nature has crafted us, if you want to use that expression. I don't know it's helpful either. But I shall call this idea the ontological dependency of the human being. In speaking of quote, the union of those who cannot exist without each other, namely of male and female. Aristotle takes the ontological dependency of the human being, both as a given and as foundational to the state. The individual cannot exist on her or his own, and therefore, says Aristotle, is like a part in relation to the whole. To that end, Aristotle goes on to offer what he considers a proof that the state is a creation of nature 
and prior to the individual. Also, Aristotle points to what he terms, quote, a social instinct that nature has implanted in all men by nature. Hume makes a similar point about the ontological dependency of the human being, but from a slightly different perspective. He begins by noting nature's cruelty to the human species in endowing us with, quote, numberless wants and necessities, but with very little, but very limited abilities to meet those wants and necessities. In this respect, we are unlike all the other animals in the natural kingdom. Given our natural infirmities, we are destined to perish, but for the fact of society through which we are able to overcome those natural deficits. As he puts it, it is by society alone that the human being is able to supply his defects and raise himself up to an equality with his fellow creatures and even acquire a superiority above them. Furthermore, Hume, as if echoing Aristotle, traces, quote, the first and original principle of human society, close unquote, to the natural appetite between the sexes, which unites them, that is the sexes, together and preserves their union. Now, even Hobbes, who may be regarded as the historical ancestor and chief spokesperson for individual existence within a contract model of governance, realizes that the very motivation of the human animal toward social arrangement in a political setting is mutual succor in a state of nature, mutual succor born out of perpetual fear and an inherent vulnerability to suffer harm. Be it noted that for Hobbes, one of the causes of war is distrust or diffidence as he calls it. So it follows for him that trust is presupposed for peace. If then we theorize with these our philosophical ancestors about the origination of political society from an antecedent, hypothetical, pre-political, and individualistic mode of existence, we cannot but conclude with them that there are some basic values necessary for socio-political existence. We may differ with them on the values we consider foundational, but there can be no denying that we share with them a belief in foundational values. Let me now very briefly, briefly illustrate this point a bit, just so as to show how the values are implicated in and foundational to our social intercourse. Consider that unless I can trust that when you speak with me, for example, you mean what you say and you have no designs to mislead me, I have no reason to believe you since I have no way of verifying the content of your mind. The issue here is the familiar logical privacy of mental states. In believing you, therefore, I'm assuming that you are honest. Furthermore, my assumptions about your honesty and trustworthiness entail also that I take you to have integrity or self-respect, which you would not want to risk jeopardizing. And to that extent, you will endeavor to do that which will be conducive to earning my regard or respect for you. Your action, verbal as well as non-verbal, will reflect a basic sense of moral propriety. My point here, in short, is that communication presupposes an interplay between or among some of the values I have prescribed. Communication is what links us together in a social setting. And it is only in such a social setting that uh, individual existence is rendered meaningful. Perhaps it might be contended that if it is true that, the social, that social life is presupposed by such cornerstone values as I have prescribed, wouldn't it follow that those values are natural to the human species? And if they are natural, what sense then does it make to say that they can be eroded by human beings or human institutions, for example, liberalism? But to this I respond as follows. Saying that the values are foundational, as I have claimed, entails only that ideally they facilitate a healthy, read morally acceptable or commendable, and successful social intercourse. 
My illustration above reflects only that those considerations that are instrumental in facilitating such intercourse, such healthy and successful intercourse. But we know also that social intercourse can be aberrant or deviant. By definition, aberrant or deviant forms of intercourse are in violation of a norm. They are opposite to a norm. Both sets of values then, the normative or positive, and the deviant or negative are foundational to my social setting. But it does not follow that we are naturally good or naturally bad as may appear. What if anything is natural about us is an inclination to pursue whatever we consider advantageous to advantageous and to avoid those things we deem disadvantageous. And sometimes, either inclination may cause us deliberately to mis mislead others through deception or lying. But precisely because this pursuit of social advantage is purchased at the price of healthy and successful social intercourse, it is deviant. It is to avoid such deviant tendencies that our parents school or socially condition us what Aristotle refers to as habituation. Always to be honest, even if our advantage is at stake. So no, saying that the values are foundational to society does not mean that they are natural in the sense claimed. Against this background then, I now will instance and elaborate what I consider the erosion of, or breakdown of moral values in contemporary society. In the incessant quest for social advantage in contemporary society, both in the economic and in the non-economic spheres, the aforementioned core values are often seen as obstacles that deliberately must be cast aside, ignored, or subverted. This perception of and attitude toward moral values in general constitute the dominant ethos in society and are manifested in the ugliest forms in the corporate world and among politicians, athletes, and entertainers. Consider, for instance, the case of the energy corporation Enron a few years back. Here we have a situation in which the company was being plundered into bankruptcy by its executives. At the same time, its chief executive officer, Kenneth Lay, was publicly declaring that the company was solvent and thus was encouraging lower level employees not to sell their company stocks. Meanwhile, Lee and other senior executives, knowing full well the depreciating value of the company stocks, were busy dumping their own stock holdings in the company. By the time the correct information about the financial situation of the company was unearthed, the company's stocks had plummeted and they had become practically worthless. The net effect of all these on lower level employees was that many of them lost most, if not all, of their retirement savings, which are held in company stocks. Some employees had been working with the company for decades. Among politicians, recall Bill Clinton's sexual impropriety with Monica Lewinsky, a then 22-year-old White House intern. This affair almost cost Clinton his presidency because, among other things, he brazenly and shamelessly looked directly into an array of television cameras and deliberately and intentionally tried to mislead the American people and the rest of the world at large into believing that he had never been sexually involved with Lewinsky. More recently, we have the sexual allegation against former IMF chief Dominic Strauss-Kahn, who has now admitted to what he calls his, quote, moral failing claiming that he did have a sexual relation with a hotel housekeeping maid, but claimed that it was consensual. Not to mention the case of Governor Max Hanford of West Virginia, who, quote, disappeared for seven days visiting his mistress in Argentina, abandoning his family, abandoning his office and his responsibilities. Remember, Sanford is married. Also, there is the case of Congressman Mark Foley, who was alleged to have been sending pornographic materials to an underage male congressional page. And the case of Governor Rod Blagojevich of Illinois, who on December 9, 2008, was arrested by the FBI and indicted on fraud charges for allegedly attempting to, quote, sell to the highest bidder, close quote, the Senate seat vacated by then President-elect Barack Obama. 
Blagojevich has since been convicted. Finally, there are athletes and entertainers such as, such as track and field star Marion Jones and baseball player Byron Bonds, both alleged to have been engaged in unfair competitive practices by using illegal performance enhancing drugs. Jones was found guilty and convicted of the crime and also was stripped of all five gold medals she had unfairly won at the 2000 Olympic Games in, in Sydney, Australia. Burns, I believe, has been convicted. And to add a Canadian content to, this, to the mix, we remember the case of Canadian sprinter Ben Johnson in the 1986 Olympics. I think it was 86 anyway. Johnson was alleged to have cheated his way to the gold medal by using performance enhancing drugs. So like Marion Jones after him, he was stripped of the medal. In all these instances of moral and legal transgressions, what we have is a negation of trust. There is deception, lying, dishonesty, and an overall lack of integrity. The driving motivation in all such conduct is social advantage. Where social advantage is the end, whatever means are thought necessary to attaining the end are also believed justified as long as those means are not prohibited by law. Let us consider the case of Governor Mark Sanford again. Even despite his conduct, he resisted any attempt to resign, saying that he had not violated the law and not even the Republican, his Republican colleagues could shake him off, so he's still there. But even when there is legal prohibition, as we have seen, that does not stop some individuals. At best then, the only limiting constraint on the individual is fear of the law. Otherwise, all else is fair game. Regrettably, this, I think, is the overriding ethos and culture of our contemporary society. I see this ethos and culture as an unfortunate byproduct, and let me repeat that, an unfortunate byproduct, an unintended consequence of liberal individualism with its rights-based conception of social life. I am not attacking liberalism, don't get me wrong on it, but I'm simply saying this is like one of those things, it comes with the territory and some people just take it and push it to the limit. By liberal individualism in the context of this talk, I mean that aspect of the liberal doctrine that emphasizes an individual's right to pursue whatever he or she deems consistent with her or his interest unless otherwise prohibited by law. I focus on this aspect of the doctrine cognizant that there is also the political aspect known as political liberalism which emphasizes, and rightly so, and advocates government neutrality on conceptions of the good life, as in matters of religion and morality overall. In other words, it's not the business of government to tell people how they ought to live their life, and also to interfere with whatever religious practices they may or may not wish to pursue. So that is uh, laudable. I consider the problem we have um, to be an unintended consequence of um, liberalism, and um, especially the rights-based um, aspect of liber liberalism. And um, the rights-based conception of social life is reflected in the economic and the non-economic spheres. In the economic sphere, liberalism engenders the pursuit of material prosperity through the unrestrained acquisition of wealth so long as no laws are violated, at least ideally. And in the non-economic sphere, it promotes a hedonistic view of life through unrestrained freedom and the quest for individual happiness. It may even be said that it is in order to advance this conception of social life that a rights-based society circumscribes limits on the power of the government vis-a-vis -vis the individual. This is clearly the thrust of John Locke's central ideas in the second treaties, and John Stuart Mill too, whose principal focus is on the individual, lucidly expresses this point as follows. The only purpose for which power can be rightfully exercised over any member of a civilized community against his will is to prevent 